Good afternoon, everybody. As I said during my presentation yesterday, leadership is one of the five key ingredients of a financial health for all movement. And that's why we focused on leadership during day two of Emerge. It's also the rationale behind the Financial Health Visionary Award. The award recognizes individuals who have shown unparalleled leadership toward building a more accessible and inclusive financial system and who seek to continue to inspire and encourage other leaders to make financial health a strategic priority. And I have the distinct honor today of helping pass the torch from our first awardee to our second. Dan Schulman, the CEO and president of PayPal, was our inaugural recipient of the Visionary Award in 2018. It's almost impossible to summarize briefly why we selected Dan for this award because the list of ways he has championed financial health is voluminous. Simply put, Dan has woven financial health into everything that he says and does. It's fair to say that his efforts, frankly, inspired us to create the award in the first place. Dan's leadership has continued unabated over the last three years. We've seen it in PayPal's response to the pandemic and to the racial reckoning sparked by the murder of George Floyd. And we've seen it in his leadership on issues such as gun violence and voting rights. Possibly his most significant effort has been around employee financial health. When PayPal measured the financial health of its own employees, it realized that they didn't have enough of a financial buffer to provide the kind of resilience and opportunity that brings stability and peace of mind and that makes for a productive workforce. And so Dan and team made a series of changes around health insurance costs, stock grants, and other kinds of benefits, which have had a direct and measurable impact. Dan has gone on to use his platform to call on all CEOs to put worker financial health at the top of their agendas. One of the fun parts of being a Visionary Award winner is getting to help choose the next recipient. Dan played a critical role in the selection process, and he's not done yet because now he'll be our first Visionary Award alum. So Dan, thank you for your leadership, your partnership, and your friendship. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our 2021 Visionary Award recipient, Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. Queen Maxima has been a tireless champion of financial inclusion, with over a decade serving as the United Nations Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. As the Special Advocate, Her Majesty is, leading, is a leading global voice on advancing universal access to and responsible usage of affordable, effective, and safe financial services. She advocates for financial inclusion at a global and country level, all in close collaboration with partners from the public and private sectors. An important focus of her work is enabling responsible technology for financial inclusion in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Since 2011, more than 1.2 billion people have gained access to financial services around the world, which in turn ignites faster progress on the social development, the sustainable development goals, and it improves economic and social outcomes for vulnerable segments. Queen Maxima has also been involved in the development of the OECD's International Network on Financial Education, launched in 2008 and now has members from over 125 countries. Complementing her work as the uh, special, ad special advocate in the Netherlands, she advocates for the importance of financial education and managing money sensibly, especially for vulnerable groups. Her Majesty, Her Majesty is the honorary chair of the MoneyWise, a platform launched by the Dutch Ministry of Finance to improve the financial fitness of Dutch citizens. Several years ago, she helped launch the Dutch Debt Lab, an initiative that brings together involved stakeholders to jointly address the problem of over-indebtedness at a late stage, as well as to identify instruments to signal early debt distress. This approach, based on applying best practices and proven methods, has now been implemented in more than 40 municipalities in the Netherlands, and it's expanding to serve specific vulnerable groups such as farmers and SMEs. I had long admired Her Majesty's work around the globe 
And then I had a chance to meet her during a visit she made to PayPal's offices back in 2017. During an intimate roundtable discussion that she and Dan hosted, I became even more impressed. She's a careful listener. She asks really smart questions. The depth of her empathy and commitment shined through in that conversation, as did her sophisticated and nuanced understanding of the global inclusion challenge and the path forward. The next year following that roundtable, Queen Maxima launched the CEO Partnership for Financial Inclusion, a partnership among a diverse set of leading multinational companies formed to accelerate financial inclusion around the world, and Dan and PayPal were very involved in that effort. One of the most notable elements of the effort was her focus on broadening the inclusion tent beyond banks and financiers to include consumer goods companies like PepsiCo and Unilever and linking broader issues of workers and supply chains to the inclusion dialogue. More recently, she's been using her voice and her platform to lift up the importance of financial health as the North Star of inclusion efforts. In December of last year, Queen Maxima launched a financial health working group with leaders from financial and development sectors, including our own financial health network. The working group aims to develop a shared vision for how to advocate for key decision makers, both public and private, to use the lens of financial health, looking at outcomes instead of only access and usage of financial services. And we're so excited to be partners in this work. For all of these reasons and more, we are honored to present Queen Maxima with the 2021 Financial Health Network Visionary Award. Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands has been the UN Secretary General's Special Advisor on Financial Inclusion for Development since 2009. She has tirelessly traveled the globe. She talks to government bodies, decision-making bodies. And the good news is huge progress has been made. Since 2011, the number of people with a financial account has grown by 1.2 billion people. I have been working for more than a decade on what we call financial inclusion. That is giving everyone, everywhere, the financial services they need to protect themselves against hardship, to invest in the future, and to really finally be able to be part of economic progress. So we still have 1.7 billion people to go, but also I think we need to pay a better attention on the quality of these services, because in the end of the day, these services are there to improve the lives of people, you know, improve their cash flows, improve their, you know, financial lives, and also be, you know, make it possible to, for them to protect themselves against shocks. It actually gives me goosebumps hearing it. It's the idea that you actually tailor the products to the individual, and then it's not just about giving them financial access, it's actually about giving them access to products they can use. We need to empower everyone and bring them into the digital financial services. And my thanks to Queen Maxima for tirelessly championing this issue and making sure that it's about everyone, not just a few. And Your Majesty, I know that with your leadership, with your enthusiasm and with your mobilization capacity, this is going to move even more quickly in the next 10 years. We must dig more deeply into how to deliver real value to the poor. Ultimately, improving lives is a promise of financial inclusion. Your Majesty, congratulations. No. Well, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful compliment. But like you very well said, this work is all being done in conjunction with many, many other partners. And uh, I think uh, when you talk about leadership, uh, it takes the leadership of many, many partners to be able to get to 1.2 billion people and actually making the changes that we need. So uh, I would take that as, as an encouragement for all of us to keep on working. Exactly, exactly. Now, you've been working in the financial inclusion space for over a decade at, at, at both the state level in your royal capacity as Queen of the Netherlands, um, as well as at the global level as the United Nations Secretary General Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. And that, I, I will say, is a mouthful. Um, yeah. uh, tell us a little bit more about what brought you to this work, right? You could have taken on any cause you wanted, given your platform and role. Why this one? Well, first of all, um, I grew up in Argentina. I was born and raised there. 
And I grew up at a moment that um, actually economically, macroeconomically, things were not doing very well. Um, I lived more than 2,000% inflation per year. And I saw middle class and actually a lot of people crumbling in their financial uh, needs and also not being able to be included in economic uh, progress. So, um, and I study economics, right? So uh, at an old stage when I was 17 years old, actually when I was 14 years old, I said to myself, I have to be able to do something to help this. So I think for a very early stage, I thought about, you know, how can we actually get into the macroeconomics, being able to help the micro. Mm. So I, that's how I got into the little by little in the whole financial inclusion, of course, with a little bit of a sidestep of being a banker in New York and, and try to help that through an emerging markets on that side. And then by the time I got to the Netherlands, I had done some work in financial inclusion. So um, then we started with the UN and it became a big financial inclusion agenda like we right now know it. But what was interesting is in the very first years that I was here in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is a very rich country, right? So, you know, comparison to Argentina, there's a very big difference. And a lady that was working with me, a very highly educated person, was about to buy a home in the Netherlands. And she was came up very stressed out and she said to me, well, you know, I don't know what mortgage to get. And uh, so I said, you know, come over, I'll sit down with you. And the funny thing is that she couldn't understand the very basic issues of the mortgages, interest rates and uh, what type, you know, and the small letter, etc. So and then when I talked to her, but listen, if you get into this, you will get into trouble if actually interest rates rise. So. I realized that this whole issue of being able to cope with that, all this information is not granted just because you study philosophy or, you know, or even sometimes financial uh, uh, studies. So this issue about, you know, being aware of knowledge of financial uh, um, issues and also the behavior um, uh, of actually having a behavior that goes, you know, leads you to a good financial stable life was made very present. And that's what we started doing the money wise work here in the Netherlands. And when we pushed through the Mexican presidency of the G20 to set up in the OECD, uh, the INFE, which is actually what globalized knowledge and best practices uh, uh, in, at the OECD for financial education. So um, yes, what we want to do with money wise is that there is a chapter at schools that teaches you, you know, um, the very specific things about risks. How do you handle risks? How do you budget? How do you save? Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to have a long term expenditure, how do you go about that? The dangers of actually, uh, you know, too much debt, but also going to specific groups. And I would talk about students, pensioners. How do you st prepare yourself to a pension life? And, uh, you know, it's been some years now and with a lot of successes, I have to say, um, but it's been a very interesting journey and uh, we've been learning as we were doing. So that's also been a very interesting thing. Um, and in the meantime, something very interesting happened, uh, which is before people that were highly indebted uh, were treated like, you know, you're fraud and you don't want to pay your, um, you know, your debt back. So I will put you more fines and I will put you more you know, um, deadlines and even the, every time the deadline is closer and shorter. And uh, and I think that we started, you know, I, we were already talking about this, but I think the general public started to understand that if you get yourself into high debt, it's not always your fault. Um, sometimes if somebody got sick, you already had a very thin balanced financial life and suddenly you got sick or when your children got sick or you make one day a bad decision and you follow it for five, six years and through fines, through interest rates, it just gets into such a big ball that you don't know what else to do. And then you don't sleep anymore. And that financial stress really takes over your life. Yes. So um, that's why we set up this with the debt lab, lab, which is in principle to cure this 500,000 households in the Netherlands that have somewhat problematic debts, but hopefully to prevent not to have them. Um, so as to have all the Dutch people and I hope all the world without this financial stress. Right. Well, I take many things from the story of your journey, but one of them is your great empathy. Um, and I think you and Dan have that in common. Um, Dan, talk a little bit about why you thought her Majesty should receive this award. Uh, there's so many things to talk about that, but first of all, Jen, let me uh, thank you for um, for all the amazing work that you and your team do. Um, may you inspire both me 
PayPal, Her Majesty, I know, and so many others, and uh, so many of your concepts and so many of your um, uh, studies have opened my eyes to so many different things. So thank, thank you, you for that. Um, where do I start with Her Majesty? I mean, she um, um, she's an inspiration to uh, so many of us. Um, you know, I think we've really stepped up the bar for who can receive this going forward. I mean, like I'm like here and Her Majesty <laughs> is doing so many of the things on, on top of that. And, you know, uh, I've known Her Majesty for, for quite some time now. We are involved in the same passion in terms of uh, uh, helping those that are underserved, um, that are most vulnerable and need our help. Um, she's turned into a good friend uh, over the years. Um, I enjoy every moment that we spend together. But what I love about Her Majesty is she doesn't need to be doing this. I mean, she's the queen of the Netherlands. She can do whatever she wants to go do. Mm -hmm. And helping those who are underserved, helping those that need our help, that struggle every single day, every single moment at the end of the month as they're trying to put and juggle all their um, essential living needs, their bills, their, um, their insurance, um, this is hard, tough work that you have to slog it out. Um, it is not just proclamations. It is not trying to work with a couple of governments to do this. This is on the ground work. And then what I have seen over the years from Her Majesty is this fervent um, passion, her ability to motivate so many of us to not give up to keep pushing, to be able to convene government officials, private and public partnerships. Um, she travels all the time to the countries that, you know, most people don't ever go to. Yeah. And I have the utmost of admiration uh, for her. She is the real deal. And um, we can all be inspired for her. And, you know, Your Majesty, I just want to congratulate you uh, on this award. It's going to be hard to follow you uh, for the third recipient, uh, but um, hopefully uh, we'll figure out who that might be. And uh, congratulations. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, Dan, the importance of partnerships. Um, and as I mentioned a few moments ago, um, our uh, your majesty, your team um, launched this financial health working group back at the end of last year to augment the global conversation uh, to focus not only on inclusion um, or sort of access, if you will, but also on financial health. What, what led you to take that step and start the work, this working group? I mean, as I mentioned, you've been doing inclusion for a long time. It's really important work. Why, why make this, um, this next step? Uh, well, you know, I always said the financial inclusion is a means to an end. I mean, uh, for somebody to have just a saving, you don't become better. Um, if that saving account is not a conduit for you to actually have a, a better life in general, to be able to, you know, uh, have a buffer for unforeseeable risks or uh, being able to invest in something you really want to build up with your family I and mean, send your daughters to, you know, to school or, or invest in a little firm that you always wanted, that dream you always had. Then, I mean, to be honest with you, financial inclusion doesn't have any purpose whatsoever. So um, financial inclusion is the means, financial health, and the outcome of actually being able to be part of an economic, uh, uh, overall economic life is the purpose. And so it's a very natural uh, thing to do. And I, I would say that without financial health and, and development of outcomes, financial inclusion would be a very uh, you know, hollow shell. Having said that, without having the access and the products out there, I wouldn't be able to do that work. So it took me some years to actually have the 1.2 billion people that they actually have access to this uh, payment account to start with and then being able to actually do uh, savings mm -hmm. and then themselves have access to an insurance, life insurance, so the husband dies, the actual family gets it, harvest insurance or health insurance. Then you know, I can make those changes, right? Or we can actually promote those changes. But without that, getting to those people with the right products, we can't really do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So Dan, you have been on this same journey of helping to helping folks to understand the mindset shift that's required to focus on outcomes. Um, and you talk to many, many business leaders um, around the globe. Um, how do you think that shift is going? Do you think uh, there's increasing buy-in? Um, is it getting easier to explain? Um, I'm assuming the pandemic maybe has made your job, unfortunately, a little easier, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Well, um, Jen, uh, as always, uh, the first time I really talked about financial health was with you um, as we started to, to move our thinking like Her Majesty from access to really the outcome that, that we all need. I mean, I, I think the pandemic probably helped expose, you know, some really disturbing trends around the world. You know, it lowered the overall water level, but, you know, there have been these issues that have been going on for quite some time. And I think, um, although we've brought a lot of people theoretically into the system, there's still a billion plus people who are outside the system completely right now. And I would say you have to at least double that for those who are in the system, but underserved by the system um, that still are charged. Um, you know, fees that are probably too high and interest rates that are too high for basic transactions that more affluent people, uh, you know, get free of charge. And I think the issue is such that and I think a lot of people think about this as, you know, those who are in extreme poverty, but this is much broader than that. You know, in the U.S. alone, there's something like, and the U.S. is a developed country, there are 185 million adults that really struggle, that are financially stressed uh, at the end of every single month. This is really, in my way of thinking about it, the new middle class. Um, and this is a real issue for, um, for the stability of you know, our economies. I would argue for the stability of our democracies as well. If the I think the like the foundation for us to have a thriving democracy is that people can rise above their own self-interest. And if you feel the system is letting you down because um, you just can't make it work no matter how hard you're trying, then you start to radicalize and you start to move towards extremes and the ability to have thoughtful, rational conversations about how we can advance as a whole become much more difficult. And I think we are witnessing that. And so I think this move towards financial health is crucial in so many ways. And every one of us has a role to play in that. And I think we should take advantage of whatever positions we are in um, to drive financial health. And, you know, that is obviously part and parcel of the mission of uh, PayPal, but it's also part and parcel of, of what drives you and your majesty and, and myself and so many others in, in our zeal to, to try and address that issue. Yeah. Well, in our closing moments together, um, you went right where I was going to go, Dan, as usual, which is, you know, many of the people listening to this and who will listen to it uh, by uh, recording later, um, these are leaders who get this, who care about this very much. Um, and I challenged people yesterday uh, to say that what we really need now is to build a financial health for all movement. Um, and that it's not a one time, once a year emerge kind of event, that this is, as you said, it's unrelenting, an unrelenting focus. Um, if you could, you know, share one piece of advice or one uh, call to action for leaders in this movement, uh, what would it be? And you could say anything you want, Dan, but one thing that we haven't had much chance to talk about now is the, is, um, uh, the importance of this for employers. That might be one thing you might want to talk about. And then I'll give the last word to Her Majesty. Yeah, that's a good thing to go do. Um, uh, so I do think that um, leadership matters. Um, it always has, but it really matters in this. And even if you can only impact one or two people, that matters. But as CEOs uh, of companies, um, 
I don't think we can rely or should rely on just the public sector to help address so many of the ills that we face as a society. One thing we clearly have in our control is the financial health of our own employees. And I think, um, you know, I was shocked when I measured that. And I think you have to have a measurement, right? We use net disposable income. How much money does somebody have left over after they pay all their taxes and essential living expenses? And you measure that location by location. Um, but we found out, and we're PayPal, we pay at or above market in all markets. We found out that for our entry-level employees, for our call center employees, um, their typical NDI was between 4 and 6%. So naturally, they were stressed out at the end of the month. We had high attrition. People worried about what they were going to do. And, you know, we made a commitment inside the company that the minimum NDI that any employee could have is 20% like increase that by four to five times from where it was. And today we're at 18%. You know, we've lowered the cost of health care benefits, as you mentioned, gave everybody equity in the company, raised salaries where we needed to, wrapped it all in a financial literacy and uh, program so people could understand it. But I'll tell you, that has made all the difference in the world in terms of our ability to attract employees it has reduced our attrition, voluntary attrition to almost zero. Wow. Our customer NPS scores are at record levels. And I think we all can do that kind of thing. And I think we should encourage each other at a minimum to start measuring the financial health of our employees. And then everyone can figure out what the right way is to start to, to help there. Excellent. Thanks. Your Majesty, the final word. Well, it's a very dangerous thing, but I think that, um, I mean, just filling up with what just Dan said, I think that first of all, yes, uh, uh, private sector has a big role to play, and I think that I hope that as a result of the working group that you just mentioned, that we can actually agree in a couple of, you know, uh, KPIs, measurements for the private sector and for the public sector that we can actually start having, because measuring is knowing and is actually much easier to advocate. And so that we can actually start to telling all these private sector players, you know, listen, it may seem it costs you money, but you will make more money. And I think that's a little bit the, the paradox we will need to actually win over. Something that seems to cost you money will actually give you back money with loyalty, with productivity, with, I mean, we know that when a with an employ, employee is actually having financial stress, his IQ goes down. One in every three employees said they have difficulty concentrating. So imagine if that wouldn't act because of financial problems. So imagine that wouldn't be there. And like Dan said, it's also the stability of systems. So that also goes for the public sector and how we can actually do so the public sector and the private sector work together in ways of, you know, like we do here in the Netherlands. Okay, there's a part that the private sector can do and then there's a part the public sector can take over in certain fields, but we need to work together a lot. And we need to know a lot more or what are the determinants of that financial health? And I think that's something that we need to do together. And I'm really thankful for the leadership uh, of uh, PayPal uh, with Dan, of course, on the lead and yourself, the network, because, you know, with your voices, we can actually try to get those type of sort of, you know, definitions, AKPIs, and uh, try to get to the public and private sector in a way that we're effective. And hopefully in 10 years' time, when we actually get a GDP, numbers yes. out, we can actually say, what is the financial health of population out? And yes. Think. Well, onward. I know I am like incredibly excited by uh, this conversation. So thank you, uh, Dan Schulman, for your incredible contributions. And uh, congratulations again to your majesty, Queen Maxima. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.